Hey guys, Desletter Magic here, and I could make an hour long video about how to invest in singles and which ones to buy and all that, but, well, one, I always put this disclaimer. People who hoard and buy out cards in all of MTG Finance can just go burn, okay? I hate them. I don't want them watching my channel. I don't make videos for them. I make videos for the average player. I'm sure you caught that vibe already. So anything in this video is small fry stuff. It's just, oh, I've got four of these in my binder. Should I trade them, sell them, use them? Should I buy these ahead of time? You know, when should I buy and sell? Just to help you save money on magic, to make it cheaper to play magic and make your money go farther. That's why I do. Should I open this, buy it, hold it, buy this deck, buy this single, you know, whatever, but not like 500 copies. I mean, even me, like, I'll buy no more than about 50 copies of a card if I really think it's going to be hot, and I think I've only done that four times ever. And I've been right three times. And plus, how many of you even have, like, an eBay account, a TCG player account, or something like that to actually liquidate the cards for near actual market price? So this is not advice for large operations. I mean, it'll kind of apply to that, but that's not what I'm going for. Those people are awful, they're just trying to act as middlemen and basically take money out of the MTG economy and put it in their pocket while making it more expensive to play the game. So also I said this could be a really long video but it's not going to be, so what am I going to leave out because obviously it appropriately would be an hour long video. Well, everything, really specific examples, charts, math, all that boring stuff, who wants to get that deep into it? I just figured super surface level MTG finance and card valuation uh, prediction I should say. And it really comes down to two things. Well, I should say as far as like, will a card go up in value or will it go down? Will it maintain its value? Is this the highest it's going to go? Just price prediction. There are, I guess, actually three factors and they all kind of run together, but I do distinguish them. Is the card good? Is it a good card? Is it a 3-3 three, three for 3 in green with no abilities? Not a good card. Add Vigilance, still not really a good card. A 6-6 six, six flyer for 4 mana with a tiny little downside. Probably a pretty good card. I mean, you can be safe to say six damage in the air for that low of mana that early game, unless the downside is, oh, you lose the game one turn after you summon it. You can say that's a good card. That is just, it, it's really easy to tell if a card is good. Convocable Exile, that could cost zero and could target anything. A zero cost universal removal. I mean, yeah, that would be good. A two cost black kill spell that has almost no limitation. That's good. I mean, even just like a 4-3 lifelinker for three, that's good. So if you've been playing Magic for any reasonable amount of time, you can spot what is a good card, or just eliminate what's a bad card. If you find yourself saying, well, that's interesting, ooh, that could be good, oh, that would be good in this type of deck, ooh, that might turn into something, that's the hallmark of a good card. Then the next level is, will that good card actually have a deck to put it in? Can you build a deck around this card? And not even just, this is the card, approach of the second sun. I'm literally building a deck around this one card. It doesn't have to be that direct. It's like, will this slot into a deck? Yes, this general archetype, it would be perfect for this. Cool. So there's a deck for it. There's what they call card support for it. And the best example for that I can give is like a counter example. Um, let's say you have an amazing mill card like um, Psychic Corrosion. It's actually in standard right now, but let's say you just can't build a mill deck, which is by the way, not true. Not right now in standard. But what if that was the only mill card? You would have to just put that in the deck and just put in the typical control, draw out the game, you know, just mill framework nonsense, but you're probably not going to mill their entire deck with that one card. But then if you look at an amazing mill card, and then there's like, well, every time they mill, they mill double, and then, oh, well, this other one makes them discard four, and then there's two other cards with recurring triggers. Okay, it looks like mill has some card support. So this amazing mother of all mill cards actually has the card support to build a deck around it. Then you go to question number three, and these are chronological. This is the third test. Will that deck be a good fit for the meta? Like right now, if you look at Slesnia, it's dump a whole bunch of stuff out for cheap quickly, vigilance preferably so that it can tap in the second main phase, and then convoke. You look at like two cards that are just like amazing for Selesnia, like a, a giant token dumper. These are all real examples, by the way. Um, Like a planeswalker that says for each creature that you currently control on the battlefield, do this. Okay, yeah, clearly the deck exists. There is card support for it, but... Let's pretend we're uh, rewinding, I think, about three years where if you were playing massive amounts of creatures, you were a crazy person because there was a ton of negative two sweepers and they were good. I mean, we're talking like Anger of the Gods where it's just three damage across the board. 
There were board wipes. I mean, multiple colors of board wipes. There were multi-target kill spells. Bile Blight, you could kill stuff that shared a name. The Enchantment Virulent Plague, negative two toughness to all tokens for the entire rest of the game. They just get summoned and die. If that's what people are playing, those are the hot cards. Those are very common, either mainboarded or sideboarded cards in other popular decks right now. Selesnia could be as good as it wants. It's going to get obliterated by what it has to play against in the popular meta. And I don't just mean the pro tour and, you know, the GPs. I mean what people are actually playing. I mean, there's so many copycat net deckers out there that they drive up prices. And I'm talking about driving up prices. Like you look at the top eight at the last Grand Prix Milwaukee. Oh, look, a bunch of cards that used to be $2, but are now $8 because... Bunch of people made it to the top 16 with that deck and that card. Cool, easy raise, but not everyone is a net decking douchebag. To phrase it as simply as possible to make sure nobody can contradict my logic on this, I always quite simply say there are a lot of 10 plus dollar cards, I'd even say 15 or 20 plus dollar cards that are not even in the top 32 at the last uh, GP results. Oh, but nobody's playing that deck. Well, apparently nobody is a lot of people. I'd say up to 75% of all Magic players just build whatever they want. They see a good card, it slots into something cool like dinosaurs, and ta-da, you've got an expensive deck. Like, I would say the last Grand Prix was Golgari Midrange, a bunch of Teferi stall crap. Um, Rekindling Phoenix is nowhere in any of those deck lists. It's still a 20 plus dollar card because people are putting it into Black Red, which is a great deck. A lot of people are playing Black Red red blue accidental phoenix tribal spell spam arc light that thing and enough people are playing with it that it doesn't matter how it did on the pro level it's still a really good deck and people want to build it so the card got pushed up so don't just go by the results because by the time you see them it's too late i mean people have automated systems and they're watching the news they're getting relayed information from actual people at the grand prix and they're making price adjustments accordingly and selling off inventory and doing buy list submissions and all that so you're not going to be faster than them don't go chasing that around you'll get nowhere but I just said, well, is the card good? Does it have a deck to put it in? You know, no matter how good it is, it needs a deck. Then is that deck competitive and can it beat what's popular? Well, how do you know what's popular without, you know, looking at some kind of tournament results? Well, one, look at early tournament results. And secondly, just jump on X Mage, MTGO, or Arena. It's not always the most accurate picture, but if you play like 50 games or 100 games with a bunch of different decks, you'll see what people are playing and be like, oh, wow, they put that together and that looks pretty good. Hey, wait a minute. The star card from that is a dollar. I think that might not be a dollar for long. That deck looks really good. And don't get blinded by, will it beat me? My deck's perfect. Maybe it was just a bad matchup. Maybe what they're playing is not that great of a deck. But if you stand back and look at a wider view and say, what would that do against mono green? What would that do against mono white? What would that do against a Golgari deck? You know what? I think that would give a lot of decks trouble. That's a pretty universal strategy. Whenever you see something like that and it involves really cheap, underpriced, underappreciated cards, uh, rare or mythic only, basically, by the way, because, I mean, yeah, there's money on commons occasionally, but come on. I mean, even Ravenous Chupacabra is really low right now. And so it's really simple. I mean, you follow those steps and, and watch what people are playing, watch what people come up with, um, maybe even look at deck lists on forums, I guess. I mean, I'd rather actively be playing against the deck to assess its power, but it's also kind of hard to get a full deck list from just playing, you know, 10 rounds against an opponent. Oh, 10 turns, I should say, not 10 rounds, 10 turns in a game. But that's really what it comes down to. Play the game, read the meta, and make intelligent decisions on what to trade away, what not to, what to pick up eight copies of, whatever you want to do. Um, just before it's widely known, if you can get a feel for it just by kind of knowing what you're doing at a basic level and playing the game and participating in the community, you're going to do better than some idiot who doesn't even play the game, but still invests in magic and pretends they know what they're doing. And you know, if they've been doing it long enough, yeah, they do, but you're going to see mistakes that anybody else looking at them is like, why did they think that was good? Why did they think that deck was going anywhere? Don't they know that's a bad matchup for that, that, that? No, they're just looking at a chart that says this jumped from 50 cents to $3 and they thought it was going to keep going because of the rate it was going up. Like, that's it. That's not considering all the information. You got to look at the meta, look at what beats what, what people are playing more commonly than others. 
what flavor of the week deck is kind of taking off and being king of the hill and how long will it take to knock it down? Is there something better? Is it gimmicky? Is it wide open? Does it have just ridiculous weaknesses that can be sideboarded against? It's all the stuff that you're thinking about when you're thinking about what deck to build and how to alter your current deck, but just project it onto card prices. It's like while you're doing that, just have in the back of your mind, hey, wait a minute, he actually won with that Mythic, and that's interesting because there's a lot of interactions there. That Mythic was crap for like the last year. I mean, no, it, it's a good Mythic, it's just nobody's playing it. But he just dropped it into this new deck, and even though it came out a year ago, like three set releases ago, now that the new set is out, it's in this deck and that's interesting. Maybe you should, you know, get your hands on a copy or two, you know, buy them from your store, trade them from somebody, whatever. And then from there, there's just these little modifiers. People like to tout these as like the biggest factors. They're the most subtle, tiny factors. Really, it's quite the opposite of what everybody says. Everything I just said as a basis, add to that, would it be popular in other formats? Like you look at Disallow, one of the best counterspells ever printed. Well, it just so happens to be one of the best counterspells ever printed. So people are starting to play it in modern because, you know, even in a sideboard, it stops anything. Like, if a card is hyper-powerful, and it's legendary, and it's mythic, and, hey, that's an interesting color combination that people have been kind of wanting in Commander. Ooh, now you got standard players that might want it, and Commander players. Now, really, Modern is the one you want to target, because that could even be up to a 4 of, which is 4 times the demand of a Commander deck. So, you know, cards like Fatal Push, a 1-cost kill spell? Legacy, Vintage, Modern, and Commander players are going to want that. Maybe not Commander, but still. Any deck that's fast, and if a deck's fast, then if your opponent's deck is fast, Fatal Push is even better. So the reason that got so high is because it was reasonably playable in Standard. I mean, Standard doesn't really need a kill spell that cheap or fast, but still, it's one. I mean, come on. So people wanted it for, you know, fast decks that play black, pretty much. But then so did entire other decks, other markets, other people, other formats, however you want to say it. More people than just Standard wanted it, and that's crazy. Because, I mean, as popular as a card can get in Standard... Um, the worst I've ever seen is, uh, Flip Jace, Baby Jace as they call it. The deck he was in was so unbeatable, he was like $70 a card and he was a standard card from Origins. Uh, past that, I think we've seen some $50 Liliana Planeswalkers, um, Kaladesh Chandra was crazy up in the 40 plus, I think. Master of Waves was even pretty high in Theros, <laughs> so was Nykthos. Uh, boy, like Hero's Downfall was 20 plus. But you see what I did there? Some of those were really good for formats outside of Standard, and some of them were only that high because they were exclusively good in Standard, or almost exclusively. Not everybody's running out to get a Chandra for the Commander deck. I'm sure it's a wonderful add-in, but modern, non-existent, basically. I'm sure somebody put her in something, but, you know. But those cards got that high just because so many people in Modern wanted them, and in that Chandra deck, Red Rush was, like, the best in the world. It was that or Teferi Time Style Nexus horse crap. Oh, Nexus was, like, 70 bucks, but that's a whole different story. It's very rare for standard-only cards to absolutely shoot through the roof, but if the deck becomes popular enough, I mean, there you go. And boy, could I name the cards where they were only good in standard. They started as a two, three dollar order because they were okay cards, but nobody knew if anybody would be able to make anything of them. And then ta-da, they're 30 bucks. And I would say the perfect example that also proves another point would be Arclight Phoenix. That card was, I think, a dollar fifty mythic. People were like, okay, it's another Phoenix that keeps coming back over and over and over as like a passive trigger that you don't have to do anything special or spend a ton of mana on. Cool. Historically, cards that come back from the graveyard over and over and over are incredibly powerful and usually worth 20 plus dollars. But you have to cast three spells and it has to be in your graveyard already. And people are just like, yeah, that's pretty narrow. That's pretty crap. And yeah, the card wasn't very good. Like you look at part of it and you're like, well, that has potential and it, it does an okay amount of damage. I could see it being annoying, but it would have to be really just one deck type that this would be run in. That's it. This is not a universal kill spell. This isn't a counter spell that's really good. It's not a dual land. Well, surprise, people built that deck and it was really good. They built literally that one deck. It's just a bunch of jumpstart, opt, spell spamming garbage. Typical, obnoxious, toxic, control heavy, is it trash? And ta da, Arclight Phoenix Army. And I think it's about 20 bucks now. So if you bought up a whole bunch of those, you're rich. But it kind of was a bad investment because you look at it like, is the card good? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it keeps coming back. It's good. It has potential. Um, does it have a deck? Does it have deck support? No. 
I mean, yes, but literally one deck. That would be the most long shot investment in the history of long shot investments, but it happened. So, you know, it's one of those things where nobody saw it coming. But just with it not being just a blatantly unplayable eight cost spell rare, you know, mythic, whatever, we're just looking at it and you're like, well, that's gimmicky and dumb. Nobody's going to play that. You know, total write off, 25 cents right off the bat. You know, you can spot those pretty easily. Anything other than that where you're like, well, it has maybe potential, it's crazy cheap. Maybe don't go out and buy 24 copies of it, but maybe don't trade it away until you see what happens over the short term. Because, I mean, what's it going to do? If it's a dollar basically bulk mythic, and then you wait a month and it's still a dollar bulk mythic, great, sell it for a dollar. There's no problem holding on to a long shot as long as it's not like five bucks and you think it's going to fall off a cliff. Now, other subtle factors, I'm just going to burn through these. Does it look like it references something that hasn't been printed yet? Or something that's only half printed. Now, this only really applied to when it was uh, two and three uh, sets in a block. But right now, Guilds of Ravnica, before Alliances comes out and before the third Ravnica set comes out, there's a card that references Guild Gates, and we only have half the Guild Gates. Really simple. I mean, the card's an uncommon, so I, I wouldn't exactly invest in it. But there are a couple cards that are rare in Mythic that mentioned Guild Gates. Uh, there are a couple that specifically mention five color, implying that five color and guild gates is going to be a very heavy deck in the near future. We just don't have all the cards for it yet. So right now it's unplayable and the demand is zero. You can scoop up every dang one of them for about 25 cents. Still a long shot, but I mean, you look at the Ixalan block. Clearly they wanted to design vampires, dinosaurs, uh, pirates, and merfolk. And they did, and they were all good and playable. So if you're looking at Guilds of Ravnica and you're like, well, clearly they designed five color and gate synergy and gate triggers to be a thing. I bet we'll see more of that. I don't think they took the time to design all those individual cards and then the deck is just absolute trash. I mean, they've done it. It was called the Constellation Mechanic and uh, Enchantment Synergy. That just fell flat on its face. But I mean, that's like looking at... I'm on Cat and saying, well, I don't think this uh, come back from the graveyard like Eternalize and Balm thing is going to go anywhere. Oh, look, they doubled down on it and did something with tokens in Hour of Devastation. Great. Oh, look, one of the major mechanics of the set clearly defined by the people who designed and playtested it is competitive at at least a basic level. I'm shocked. So anything to do with guild gates, I would drop 10, 20 bucks on right now. In fact, I'm not saying I didn't do that. So that's another fun little modifier on top of just the base level. Does it have a deck? Does it have support? Is it going to be competitive? Another really simple one. Did it used to be good? Um, right after rotation. Okay. This card is $15 and everybody's playing it. And then it went down the toilet. Uh, let's say Verderous Gear Hulk and Torrential Gear Hulk. Both of those were, I believe at one point, $6 and $30. A couple of them fluctuated back and forth. Like, Verderous Gear Hulk was, like, crazy, like a $20 pre-order. Then it didn't go in any decks. I mean, it's still a fantastic card. It just didn't go in any decks. Tanked all the way down to, like, seven, eight bucks. Maybe even lower. I think I saw it at, like, four. Then the next set comes out, and I think nothing happened. Then the next set came out, and it's like, oh, we could bring spells back and play a bunch of toxic, you know, settle the wreckage resurrection nonsense. Cool, I love casting stuff twice. Boom, Torrentials through the roof. And uh, Verderous Gear Hulk, you wait quite a bit longer, and... Oh, now dropping counters onto something is a thing because now we can like double them with, uh, I, I totally forgot every card in that deck. I have blocked it from my memory, but you know, that one that cared about counters. And then all of a sudden it was good again. And like, there was even little mini bumps where people were like, oh, a new set came out. Ooh, I wonder if Verderous would fit in that. Oh, I wonder if Torrential would fit in that. And they kept bouncing up and down. Well, that's when it comes into play. Did it used to be good at one point? It provably was in a deck archetype, and that goes double if nothing cycled out. Now, if the deck got crippled because of a cycle out, maybe the next couple sets will re-enable that kind of archetype, that kind of feel, and ta-da, the card will come right back. I mean, for every one of those, there's an Archangel of Ties where it was like, eh, three bucks, three bucks, three bucks, three bucks, and then like, what, six set releases later, people were like, holy crap, this fits perfectly in this deck, and it hit, like, 20 bucks. You read the card, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is one of the best white cards ever printed, but it was a little high curve, had to have the right deck, the right support around it, and it just never materialized. Doesn't mean it's a bad card, it's still a fantastic card. Remember, step one. So number two, does it have uh, support? No, but will it in the future? Yes, maybe. You know, making it a maybe investment. And then, hey, if it takes off after a set release, great. And if you're so much as looking at spoilers and you're like, whoa, remember that card from four sets ago that's a mythic that everybody thought was good and then never turned out? 
uh, works great with these two cards or works great with this mechanic. Hello, acquire every copy you can before anybody gets uh, wise about it. But it's even easier when you're like, well, that used to be a $20 card and now it fell to four. Cool. If you've got a couple more set releases before that set cycles out, pick up a couple copies. Hyper powerful cards that have proven themselves in combat before tend to come back. Another really simple one, what's the availability of it? Could you only get the card from a Planeswalker deck? Which I've been telling people about this since beforehand, during, and afterwards. The Ajani card from the M19 Planeswalker deck, availability went down because there was five unique decks, not two, and that card is insane. It's actually better than the real Ajani in some decks. And surprise, it hit like nine bucks because the supply was nowhere near the print volume of a normal Mythic. Not even on the same planet. I bet 10 times less copies of that Ajani exist than any other Mythic from any other set. Well, recent set. So the cards from the front of the gift pack, those five cards, if any of those shoot up in price, which I <laughs> told you so, Angel did. I think on TCG Player, there are 10 total copies of that Angel available in the entire world. And they're like four bucks a piece. You know why? Because almost none of them exist. They're not in booster boxes. They're from a product that people don't typically buy. Instead of, oh, if this card becomes wildly popular, it'll hit X dollars. It's, if this card becomes vaguely popular with literally anyone, the supply is a hundred times lower. It will shoot up in price for the slightest tiny little reason. Like right now, white kind of rampy angel tribal. Angel from the gift pack from M19 slots right in. Ta-da, that's all you need. And I'll watch that vampire after the release of Orzhov, by the way. So singles with artificially lowered supplies, always keep an eye on them. I would almost just keep some amount of them around, regardless of power, unless they're just horrible cards. But uh, I mean, even when you're like, well, that's just a stupid, dumb gimmick filler nonsense, like Star of Extinction, surprise, that card's $9. It's pretty hard to write off something unless you're like, literally a better copy of this exists. Like this costs six, there's an identical card that costs five. We can safely say this card's trash. You know, a scenario like that where you're like absolutely sure. Or like a seven cost sorcery that says, gain seven life and discard a card. Wow. Like that's garbage every day of the week. Anything else with a blatant disqualifier, I would just keep it on your radar. Because remember, the best investments I've ever made and the most money I've made on something that shot up, either a sealed product or anything else, it's been done by ignoring what everybody else is doing, thinking, and saying, and just doing the opposite. Oh, gift packs are bad. Cool. I guess if everybody thinks they're bad and nobody's ordering them, Wizards is going to cut the uh, print run, and those shooting Starlands are going to be worth a fortune. Oh, look, they were. And I sold them for about 13 bucks a set when I was paying about ten fifty for the gift packs. And I got boosters with it. If everyone is saying, that's a bad product, I don't like it, blah, 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 I'm bad negative press, ooh, I hate these. And then you're thinking, but they're collectible lands from a popular artist. They've never been printed in foil before, I think. Um, you know what? I feel like people are going to want this. And on top of it, everybody else is saying, don't buy it which means that everybody's not buying it. Which means that if I buy it, I'll have a whole bunch, but nobody else will. Hmm. So don't be afraid to go against what everybody's saying, because if you're following what everybody's saying, then you're following. Whoever the first one was to think of something or say something or draw a certain conclusion, by the time you hear about it, it's probably too late. So I'm not just saying take everything everybody says, invert it, do the polar opposite, and you'll make money. I'm just saying you have to be able to identify the opportunities where what the majority is saying is possibly or likely incorrect. That is the best investment opportunity by far. Like everybody, eh, Masters is bad. The last two Masters were bad, so clearly this one's going to be, even though they had a year to fix it. Hmm, they raised the price by $100 and then put a $100 extra booster in it, so not really, they didn't raise the price at all. And they're saying this is going to be the last one ever, and they lost money on the last two. Or I should say, well, pe people lost money, people were pissed. They, they lost customer goodwill and customers. Hmm, put all that together and do you think the evidence points to Ultimate Masters being good? Yes. So I bought 13 grand worth of it. I'm going to be flipping rich and I know at least two other store owners that purposely under-ordered because they're like, ah, eh, Masters again, ah, eh, Masters equals bad, me smart. And that's like literally all the thought they put into it and so they ordered like, one case? Yeah, they're kicking themselves hard right about now. I knew better, so I did the opposite. 
So don't be afraid to do that. So those are all on top of the framework. Do not forget the first half of this video where I said it still has to meet those bare minimum requirements. So hopefully this basic overview, because there's a lot more to it than this, looking up histories and trends and other just subtle little things that I do to make sure I'm making a correct decision. I'm not going to go over all of them. I just wanted to hit a couple little bullet points on just the basics. Just how to, at a basic level, make the correct decisions on card valuations of when to buy and sell. Hopefully it makes you guys a little bit extra money. Or, like I said, if you're not into, you know, buying and selling this whole, ooh, I'm a miniature stockbroker nonsense, at least it'll help you save money on buying a deck and buying the cards for it, building a deck, I should say, uh, at the right time. If you're like, oh, these are cheap, I think they're going to go up because of literally everything I just said in this video, and I think I might want them for my deck. You know, maybe pick up in trade or purchase for cash four copies and maybe an extra couple. You maybe pick up six copies or something. Oh, look, it went up, and you didn't have to drop $100 on a playset of them for your deck. Wouldn't that be nice? And that's the scale I'm targeting with this video. So if that's you, hopefully you leave a big old like on this video because I'm sure it helped you a lot, and I will see you guys next video.